Hey everyone. Welcome. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 735th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the immense pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Carrie Schneider and Ayana Dozier. We are thrilled to welcome poet Aristilde de Kirby here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Carrie Schneider has presented her photographs and videos at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Finnish Museum of Photography and elsewhere. In March, 2023, she will open Sphinx, a major museum solo exhibition at Mass MoCA, curated by Susan, Susan Cross. Carrie serves on the board AIM by Kyle Abraham and lives and works in Hudson and New York City. Brooklyn-based artist and writer and rail contributor Ayana Dozier centers film, performance, and installation in her artistic work with a specific concentration on surrealist, conceptual, and feminist practices. Her films have screened at festivals across the US and the UK. Ayana's work is currently on view in When I Am Empty, Please Dispose of Me Properly at Brick, and Ayana's solo exhibition, This Country Makes It Hard to Fuck, opens at Microscope, Microscope Gallery on February 2nd. I'm so excited to have you both here with us um, this afternoon, and great. I'm thrilled to pass it over to you, Ayana. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really ecstatic to be in conversation with you, Carrie. Um, the requests came in the midst of a lot of things happening, but it was something that I was like, I will make time for this. <laughs> I will figure it out. Um, I have followed your work for um, a while now, but uh, most recently you had uh, a solo show entitled Revenge Body, um, that premiered last year. And uh, that just floored me. Um, and I think I'm really interested in putting that in dialogue with your current exhibition on Viet Chart. I don't know her. Um, but before I get into the, you know, details, specifics, and all the things I want to pick your brain about, um, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I'm doing okay. I, I'm just so grateful. Um, I'm seeing all of these familiar faces and names in the grid. And I'm, yeah, I'm just feeling um, kind of overwhelmed. I'm really, really grateful for you, Ayana, for being here. You just had a huge opening on Thursday. And you're going to have another big show open on this Thursday, a big solo show. Yeah. I just, I mean, it's a dream to have you um, here in conversation. So just thank you for making the time. Um, yeah, how, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I think, um, you know, to reiterate for my enthusiasm for this conversation and your work, um, despite everything that's happening in my life, I was like, this needs to happen. <laughs> so, I'm um, honored. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, it really is a credit to just the amazing work you have um, have always done, but, you know, of, of late, it really is stellar. Um, so I guess to begin, I actually want to talk about the first time I like physically met you after, you know, following you um, online for a while um, was at My Color Dark Room, which is where we both uh, print at. Um, and I remember you came in and you were dragging this black, huge duffel bag <laughs> of, you know, clearly <laughs> an entire roll of paper. And, you know, you were kind of waiting for me to finish up as it was about to close. And I was trying to put two and two together because I was thinking this person's going to develop an entire roll of paper. And I was like, who would develop an entire roll of paper? Like, that's insane. And then I was like, oh, I wonder if it's her. And sure enough, it was. Um, so I, I guess starting there and just, you know, kind of opening the door to the process, um, Let's kind of unpack how you came to 
to work with paper and making direct prints onto paper and then to allow it to literally spill forth beyond the frame to have it mm -hmm. occupy the sense of mass of uh, fluidity and a sense of unraveling that is not only extremely process oriented, but I would say a very complicated thing to get at as, you know, working with color uh, printing for those who are unfamiliar in the audience is not like uh, black and white uh, darkroom printing where you have a safe light, everything happens in the dark. And to take on, you know, several hundred feet of paper of not only that sale, uh, scale and size, but also the, the time of thinking of what those images are gonna be takes a little bit of, of thinking through. And I'd love to have you speak more about that and walk me and the audiences through how you came to that decision. Yeah, thank you. I mean, what, what a treat to speak with someone about this who's actually been in a color dark room. There, there aren't all that many of us. I mean, it's really, it's a dying art. And I think that's also part of the attraction of it to me, right? Is that, you know, it's even hard to source the paper that I'm using. So this color chromogenic paper in the midst of the pandemic, there was, you know, all of the, the supply issues. And I, you know, had to wait months and months to get um, more of this paper that I was using. Um, but I, I think it, um, you know, I, I have to say the pandemic really, really forced this, um, the, this process in that I, um, you know, I, I had been working in a much smaller scale, exposing color photograph, pho color photographic paper directly through the lens of a camera, um, but uh, exposing it in uh, uh, like the the negative sheets. I wish I, I had one that I could show you. Um, I'm kind of thrown off now that I can't see Ayanna's face large anymore. Um, <laughs> like looking at my own art. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I, I, in the pandemic, I think I was just, I had like a really, um, I don't know, lousy time, even though my, my beautiful friend, Eris, who's going to, to read later was a neighbor of mine. I, I think I, you know, a, a lot of us had really awful pandemics, but I think mine, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I felt very isolated and I um, have this, this studio in which I'm pretty cramped, but I, I think it kind of forced me to, um, to do something I maybe wouldn't have otherwise done, which is make my own camera. Um, I uh, decided to kind of scale up and expose this color chromogenic paper directly through the lens of the camera. And I think, um, I, I think it just kind of all this kind of time and space and this kind of misery and isolation allowed me to kind of come to a lot of different conclusions, including that, you know, the um, a lot of photographic materials, as you know, are, you know, they come in rolls. So, you know, like rolls of film, rolls of 16 millimeter film. I know you're also a filmmaker. Um, you know, they, they come in spools. And so I was cutting the paper in the dark and I was getting all these irregular cuts. And then I just decided, oh, what if I don't cut the paper? What if I just continue to kind of find a way? I made my own camera. What if I figure out a way to just pull the paper down, expose sections at a time, and then don't cut it? You know, it kind of just lent itself to that. I feel like, you know, there were kind of these weird jumps in logic that now seem inevitable. So it's hard for me to, to trace back. But, but I think in a way, um, the material, I just kind of listened to what the material wanted, if that makes sense. I think it might to you. <laughs> No, it absolutely does. And you already mentioned it, um, but I, I kind of want to speak a bit more on it, um, are the, the setbacks and the delays of sourcing the materials and how for a lot of people who don't work with analog uh, photography, and especially during COVID, um, there were a lot of interruptions. And I think the other aspect of the work that I'm attracted to beyond just you know the the sheer feet of it, um, which would be complicated outside of a pandemic, and or outside of the fact that analog materials are scarce, um, is is that scarcity um, element of knowing that sometimes there have been delays that are literally you know eighteen months, two years um, for for something that you need, and and or the fear that when you see a delay that's eighteen months. Uh, 
it could also, at least with Fuji, can mean potentially like, oh, actually, after that delay, they're going to say, never mind, we're no longer making this. Um, so can you speak a little bit about the patience, I suppose, that comes with um, having to trust these materials and having to let them have their own autonomy, which I think has been my experience working with film, is that it's humbled me as an artist, mm -hmm. um, because as much as you want to perfect everything, um, there are just way too many things that are outside of your control. Um, and so I'd love to hear you speak more about that patience and what that does to your approach to not just making these vertical roles, but um, to your overall art practice. And then separately from that, um, what is your relationship with some of these um, analog mediums, specifically those roles and specifically with Kodak who could honestly go bankrupt again any day, knowing that this may not be something that could exist five years from now, right? Like this actually might be one and, you know, the next opportunity might not happen. Wow, there's so many things I wanna say. Yeah, these are such great questions. Oh my God. Um, yeah, you you work in analog also. I mean, analog can break your heart. You know, like some of these prints, like that long print that you saw me bring into my own color lab that day, you know, I could carry it under my arm like this. It was, you know, small enough, but, um, you know, it's actually 275 feet of, it, it took me three weeks to make that. And so when I first see it coming out of the, the chemicals, I, you know, I, I feel like my palms are sweating. I'm like, did it even turn out? And there were so many times where it even doesn't, you know, maybe the material itself had been exposed on its way to you in the truck. I don't, you know, you just don't even know. Um, and I think what you're talking about this, how to channel patience in that and kind of embracing the failures, the potential for failure. I think that's part of what makes it exciting and kind of um, unknowable. I, don't, I, I think that there's something uh, about working analog that, you know, there can be this kind of quest for perfection. And I think I'm kind of, I'm kind of trying to work against that by, by using this, this process where there's not that much literature made on it. Like it's a little bit more, maybe more on the, on, in the realm of what like an outsider might do. <laughs> you know, it's not, it, it, it's not, you know, in the quest of perfection, I'd say. I mean, I'm inviting in these accidents, but I think this material engagement or this investigation that I'm doing, it's really antithetical to, to preciousness or to perfection. And I think that part of that, um, having the scarcity of the materials, I think it, it um, there's a, I had to pretend that that didn't exist <laughs> because I think, you know, feeling that this, you know, material was scarce. I, I, I think that that um, it's, it would have been, um, it would have hurt my process because I can't treat it preciously. I have to keep moving. And, um, and I think that's, you know, maybe that's a metaphor for life right? <laughs> you know, it's all going to end. So, uh, you know, like what, what can we do while we're here? Yeah, no, that's, it's extremely poignant. I think that bit of um, not treating it as precious as it actually is. It's almost like, you know, fine China, but you're like using it as like a paper plate. <laughs> because <That's totally. laughs> so much of how you're able to arrive at something that you're satisfied with comes from mistakes. And unlike other forms of, and not necessarily even art making, just photography is, you know, you're able to either see the mistakes as they're happening and course correct. Um, whereas with analog photography, you have to go through everything. So it's like, as you were even saying that it took you three and a half weeks to make like to do the photographing onto the paper, right? And then you don't know if there was, you know, a hiccup, if there was a light leak, if, you know, you didn't roll it correctly until all of that labor is done and then it goes through the printer. Um, and, and yeah, I think you had said it earlier, you said it could break your heart because I've been not in, in that way, but in various ways, I've had those moments where you think you've done everything correctly and then you get it and it's just this this colossal error and you're just like should I give up everything yeah. <laughs> what yeah. am I doing <laughs> um, I, I understand yeah 
Yeah. And I guess speaking on trial and error, um, if we can talk about the film, because I ran into you, um, I think the day after your opening uh, for uh, I Don't Know Her, and we were able to chat a bit more there where I was trying to assess how you shot um, the, the video component um, of the work where I remembered you were doing work at Mononor Warwe, uh, which is a Brooklyn-based uh, film community uh, for 16 millimeter, super eight millimeter and 35 millimeter motion picture lab. Um, and I had like saw that you were doing that like months and months and months ago. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And I had thought that you were, you know, taking um, one of the animation printers um, or cameras there. And, you know, you took that and then you ran it through a 16 millimeter, you know, projector and then projected on onto color paper. Um, but then you had kind of told me, you're like, oh no, that actually didn't work out. Um, so I'd love to have you just say a bit more about um, maybe not necessarily the original process or the original intention, um, but more about that moment of having to pivot um, and how you were able to find a way to make the vision still work um, with this film that's on view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, you're 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 pointing to a moment of um, extreme compromise for me <laughs> because I think there is this um, kind of lore or insistence on. Um, keeping things analog, the authenticity of that, and like we were just talking about, kind of the um, the uh, potential for error that can actually give you something really beautiful and kind of um, uh, unusual, something you've never experienced before. And um, I was taking the photographs that I was making. So to make this body of work, I I exported one hundred and thirty nine stills from this um, well-known viral video of Mariah Carey um, shot, uh, shot, shaking and nodding her head um, after she says the famous phrase, I don't know her, um, but I had taken all of the frames and um, from my phone, I had played it from YouTube and every single frame I exposed that through the kind of Franken camera that I built in my studio. And then I wanted to copy stand it, basically stop motion animate it frame by frame. And I had wanted to do that from the original um, photographs, you know, just to kind of keep it analog to go right from the, the paper to film. And um, uh, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't working totally correctly. I think it, um, there was, uh, just kind of a loss of um, uh, skill on my part. You know, I just, I think it's something that I would need more time to kind of um, not perfect, but kind of, it was, it just, this learning curve was too steep given my deadline. And so I think in the future, that would be something I would love to do. But, um, you know, I, I think just given the, the reality of, of my life, kind of, you know, having a young child and kind of living part-time upstate and, um, not having my own copy stand, you know, I had to go to Mano no Aware. Um, they were super generous with me and they were amazing. Um, you know, they have something called an Oxbury animation stand, which is impossible to find. They don't have one at MPAC. They don't have one at Bard College. You know, I was just calling around everywhere. Does someone have one I can use? And um, fortunately there was one in Brooklyn, but it just, um, so maybe in the future, that's something I could figure out how to do. But what I ended up doing was kind of taking a digital step and then re-exporting it, um, kind of copy standing it digitally and then exporting it to 16 millimeter film. Yeah, I think even in walking through that, I think it it's also speaks to, for those who don't work with the medium, not just the scarcity of like the printing materials, but like even just the construction of these materials. Like yeah. some of them seem so simple and yet, <laughs> they don't exist <laughs> anywhere of like, if you want to do a very simple, you know, um, kind of animation still like that, that actually in and of itself requires so much that is lost to us now. Um, and I think uh, as I was like watching the film, um, I was, you know, obviously I want to talk about Mariah and we will talk a lot about Mariah. Uh, but I think my brain just kept thinking of like, like how, how, how was this um, achieved? Because um, a lot of the equipment to do so is, is actually just not available. And so I think even the fact that you were able to achieve 
the vision, um, at least to an outsider, I think is still utterly remarkable. Um, and I think, again, speaks to the sense of ingenuity you need to have when you're working with analog materials. Um, I think to that end, I want to I want to come back to the camera um, and the digital negative, but I, I want to save that almost as a bookend as we also talk about um, your previous exhibition, Revenge Body. Um, so let's use this as an opportunity to talk about Mariah Carey <laughs> and to move into that uh, uh, kind of weight of refusal of, I think what you told me was a feminine refusal uh, mm -hmm. that undergrids the exhibition and you know a lot of the recent work that you're doing, um, which is also then thinking of these women who have the same name as you, you know, but they're not you and they're not related to you, you know, um, and I don't know if you know Mariah Carey, but like they don't know you personally per se, right? Um, and so it's trying to find those aspects of uh, an avatar even um, in other women who could be a version of you out there that I think is so fascinating. Um, and I just would love if you can say more about that, because I know this is a larger body of work you're you're kind of pulling upon, um, and then maybe use that to speak to Mariah's influence. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I had been making these, uh, or sourcing these kind of pop cultural uh, portraits of, of women who shared my name. Uh, so I was looking at Carrie from the scary movie played by Sissy Spacek. Um, I was looking at Romy Schneider. I've been looking at her, a lot of the, the photographs behind me in my studio um, have her, her face. Um, and, and then it kind of dawned on me that you know, Mariah Carey, her, her last name is of course, uh, just a different spelling of my first name. And it, it is kind of this um, pretty flat footed entry point to something that um, I don't know, that kind of does have some kind of resonance that I, I think in a, if I'm to theorize it, maybe it's a little bit um, pointing to something like a, like a malapropism where uh, it kind of reveals something um, kind of this like clunky way that uh, we think of, uh, you know, that thought translates into language and how, how there are these gaps. And, and I think that's something that Young t spoke about are kind of these synchronicities that kind of make us um, attracted to something and um, not really knowing uh, or kind of trusting that that intuition. And I think that a lot of the work that I've been making was kind of coming from this intuitive place. And you know, I think in particular, Mariah Carey, this this um, this moment where she was interviewed by. A, a German television station, I believe it was in the year 1999 or 2000, um, they uh, kind of ambushed her a little bit at a very vulnerable time in her life, <laughs> um, kind of like around the, the glitter moment. And um, they had, um, the interviewer had, the male interviewer had asked her, um, you know, what do you think about Beyonce? And sh she says, uh, oh, I love Beyonce. She's such a good singer. She writes her own music. Like, such such a really nice person. We love Beyonce. And then he says, what do you think about JLo? And she said, I don't know her. And then just shakes her head and nods her head. And, but I, I feel like, um, you know, it's kind of something that went viral. I, I have friends who use that phrase intentionally, maybe unintentionally, you know, as a way of kind of just um, negating something or kind of like protecting oneself, this, this kind of way of saying, yeah, you, you don't really have permission to enter into that um, interior, you know, my interiority. And I think it's this really pristine example of feminine refusal, you know, of like, a, like I spoke about. I think it, I have, um, on one side of my family, there are a lot of scientists. I think I, I mentioned to you, my dad's a forensic scientist. I feel like I kind of like did a forensic analysis of this, um, you know, the, these frames to kind of see the perfection with which Mariah Carey performs um, this act of negation, it's incredible. And I, I think that um, it's something that needs to be preserved. I just, I think it's it's really amazing kind of in this like golden record kind of way where this is something that, um, yeah, is like high culture. <laughs> no, I completely agree. And I think if audiences don't know why she would pivot to that. I mean, there's a whole 
backstory. You can get in with JLo and Mariah, but um, ultimately um, going through the divorce with um, Tommy Mulatto from the CEO of Sony, which was she was still signed to at the time, um, he was leaking all of her samples to Jennifer Lopez um, exactly. and kind of driving um, Mariah Carey, you know, just abusing her in a very uh, professional, but also, you know, a personal way. And, um, and JLo already had her own accusations of Ashanti singing for her, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a moment where <laughs> I think it's beyond just JLo as like, uh, a person that she's trying to dig into and more, I think that refusal of also, you know, the going through a divorce, leaving a very um, tumultuous environment and, and trying to hold on to the fantasy of everything, you know, um, which I don't think is, uh, I, I think she's often derided for that where, and I know I spoke to you briefly about this and, you know, in reading her memoirs, um, mm -hmm and revisiting um, a lot of what we would dismissively call the diva status of a woman like Mariah Carey and other women like her is actually how hard they hold on to um, the worlds that they created, right? These fantastical environments of, you know, softness and of, of glitter, of pleasantries, of beauty, um, that in reality for me, I think mask a lot of pain and heartache. And I was reading the, the booklet that accompanies this, the collaborative booklet in which Aerosol's um, wonderful poem also um, uh, appears in. Um, and I was reading about the soundtrack elements of it where Mariah Carey's song, you know, fantasy is sampled as well as honey um, and a bit of um, obsessed. And I would love for you to say a little bit more about the collaboration uh, of this forensic investigation into this video that unfolded not just through uh, the booklet, but through the soundtrack and um, and yeah, and I actually then I want to use that to come back to the music itself. Sure. Um, yeah, I maybe um, one thing I could say. Um, oh, I'm just thinking of so many things. The I I had listened to this brilliant podcast that um, my my friend who lives on, on the West Coast, who's a, a media theorist, Mashinka um, Hakopian, mm -hmm. was interviewed actually about Mariah Carey and about the the kind of the, the diva. It was actually in the um, uh, what was it called the uh, the podcast where uh, Meghan Markle was interviewing Mariah Carey. Oh, uh, Arctic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then. Um, Mashinka, a, a, a friend of mine, you know, she was asked as kind of like the, the PhD philosopher, you know, like what, so tell, have us make sense. What is, what, what is the diva? And she sums it up in this really brilliant way that, you know, women, people on the margins, people of color, you know, people on the margins of society, you know, if, if they are rise in the public imagination, so too they must fall. And so she kind of traces this thing, how to be a diva, like, um, Mariah has kind of, she's always embraced that and um, that that's, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, there's a double-edged sword to that, that the public can't wait for you to, to crack um, or crumble. Um, so I, I just think it is um, this moment of seeing there's not a crack <laughs> in this, you know, that it, there is this pristine quality um, to this clip itself, but to, to get to the, the collaboration, um, my long-term collaborator, Cecilia Lopez, is an amazing um, artist, uh, sound artist, musician based in Brooklyn. And we've worked together on things for about 10 years, maybe over 10 years now. Um, and I asked Cecilia if, if she could make the soundtrack for this. So we, just from the very beginning, I sent her the original clip, sent her kind of the first edits, she would send me things back. And, and it, so it was a true back and forth where she, um, her, her, uh, her edits, her kind of segmenting uh, and her choices of the songs and kind of my suggestions that kind of came, the back and forth really influenced um, the visuals. And I, I think it was just a true conversation. It's kind of hard to trace, but I think um, in, in the booklet, one of the pages, and I think it might be in the slideshow, you can see her, um, kind of the 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 splicing of of her of 
she recorded all three of those songs through an actual 16 millimeter projector. Here we go. And then, um, and then digitally uh, mixed it together. And it's kind of this very jarring, uh, I don't know, but the, the, I think we decided that the length of the film would be exactly the length of a long pop song. You know, there are all these decisions that we made that, you know, I, I forget to even talk about, but that are very core to how um, it ended up. Yeah, um, I think on that note, maybe we should play the video clip so audiences can have a sense of um, what we're listening to. And um, then we'll come back and dig a little bit deeper into those sonic cues. Great, thank you. So good. Um, so why those three songs, Fantasy, uh, Honey, and Obsessed? Ooh. Um, oh my God. Now I can't even remember what the um the whole core of it was. I, I think the um oh I'd have to go through, <laughs> I'd have to go through so many emails. I I feel like there's some of her her greatest hits and her, her greatest turning points. <laughs> um, I think that just the idea of even just the um, kind of aspirational ideas of the, um, the titles of fantasy and obsessed, just kind of the, um, that they're, they are, they kind of are charged and kind of uh, create a tension even <laughs> just in the ideas of kind of wanting to create this fantasy having, um, being scrutinized, being followed, being stalked, um, um, others wanting you to be taken down or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, now I'm trying to, trying to remember some of the details coming out of her, her autobiography. But anyway, you could probably tell me more. There's probably, you're like, exactly why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, as I was reading the booklet, cause there's a little bit of, you know, um, info about it there. Um, I, I remember, I think several or two main thoughts come to mind of, so, and this is like a personal reflection of Mariah Carey. That's from me, uh, where I think she spent most of the nineties trying to craft the perfect pop song, um, where the DNA is almost similar. So for those who are listeners or for those who would love to do research, um, if you listen to dream lover, fantasy, honey, and heartbreaker, they have a very similar core. And she's like talked about it a little bit where she's um, pushed back against criticism where someone was, she said if she was a folk singer, no one would um, scrutinize the details of some of the similarities because it's her style. Like it's, you know, it's part of her like mode of writing. She's the same songwriter. Um, but those four songs um, in which Dream Lover is like so-so in my opinion, um, Fantasy is probably the, it, it's it's the peak, but it also, it's, it's not. Like I actually think Heartbreaker is where she perfects it. And it's just this gradual evolution also of her as a child, you know, I mean, she's a genius in my opinion, but you know, she was 20 when she wrote or actually 17 when she wrote a lot of her first album and et cetera, et cetera. So there's also that maturity, I think. And especially by the time we then get to Obsessed where she's like full on grown woman um, across that beat of dream lover of really almost like a child's narrative of like, 
I want to fantasize about a boy and he's going to come in my dreams. And then you have fantasy that also doubles down on that of like plain make-believe, which she's also stated that, you know, she wasn't living any of um, the songs per se um, that were about love in her first albums while she was married. And that yeah. it's only when we get to Honey, when she has this affair with Derek Jeter and then Heartbreaker, <laughs> <laughs> where he like breaks up with her, where we start to get an embodied response. And then to me, it's that sense of life allowing her to embolden her to actually speak truth to what she was living with. Um, and, and then, you know, I could I could go on and I'm sure we could go on Amazing. about her history of sampling as lived experience and all of that detail. Um, but I, I love then how part of that narrative of, of what I'm obsessed with that period of her time is included in, in here, um, not just because fantasy and honey are her biggest hits. Um, but then how that does lead us to, um, a song that's like 12 years removed um, or 15 years later, actually, from Fantasy Obsessed, where we get this really self-confident, um, I don't want to say hardened, but mm -hmm. uh, assured woman, um, where she crafts just some of the best lyrics of all time yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that I think plays into that moment that you're capturing and dissecting so eloquently here of, you know, a woman at a real breaking moment, a uh, period in her life, apologies, um, that then there's a before that you've included sonically. And then there's this wonderful triumphant after where mm -hmm. for the most part, we have a Mariah Carey where people are reassessing her value. She's still with us. She seems to be thriving. Um, she has a, a boyfriend who's 15 years her junior. Um, and yeah, she has, uh, she seems to be in a space of care and she's our Christmas queen, you know? So, um, I think there's there's a real beauty there that is allowing us to revisit a moment in time that gives us the things that anticipate it, but then that that follow it in a way that we normally don't. That I think is really that's a, that and I think is an interesting detail to pick up on um, out beyond the image that's included in this collaboration. I love what you're saying. I mean, I, I totally I couldn't agree more. I, I think that you know one thing that you know maybe isn't is even redundant to say is that you know the the, the strength of fantasy uh, you know uh, we only played one minute of the four minute film but it's it's a little bit hard to pick up on the honey samples and the obsessed samples um in, in the in the soundtrack it's it's an optical soundtrack and that it's actually embedded in the 16 millimeter film so it's kind of and it's played through these really you know kind of pretty shoddy old school speakers that come um, in the body of the 16 millimeter camera. So it's it's a little bit hard to pick up on the base, <laughs> especially, but um, but it, it does kind of provide this texture to something that we're witnessing kind of the before and after it does collapse time in this way that I think it 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 does kind of provide something that's kind of a little more mysterious and dark and kind of uh, like we're we're kind of experiencing a bunch of different moments at once. Yeah. Um, while we're here um, on uh, an image that's a print, but it's a negative, um, I think maybe this would be a great time to uh, say a little bit more about um, the negative to positive process and maybe the decisions behind that that come across where some of your prints are the negative um, and then some of them are the, the kind of positive of how you're then thinking about almost the kind of, I don't want to say, well, maybe the balance of it that comes from, you know, the underbelly. I always think of, you know, the negatives as, you know, just the, that kind of other side of, of, of the print that, you know, allows it to be obviously on a technical level, but there's also something deeply conceptually rich about having access to the negative um, because it's also, um, a privilege uh, to see how the image comes to be. Um, and mm -hmm. I just love to hear you say more about that evolution across, um, not just, I don't know her, but uh, across this uh, body of work you're producing. Wow. I mean, and that's such a really beautiful way of thinking of that. Thank you for that. I mean, I think the um, exposing color photographic paper through the lens, it actually renders the image in into a negative. And, and so what you can see here in this image uh, um, is a, 
a, a negative, you see my hand in it's kind of this blue cyan color holding up a phone with Mariah's face on it. Um, and but it's an inverted, it's a negative. And then the, right below it, I rephotographed the image above through the, the same lens directly onto um, color photographic paper again, using the same process and it inverts the image. And then the last one below, at the very bottom is uh, rephotographing through the lens, the middle image, and it inverts it again. And I think this there was sort of this um, eureka moment in the pandemic when I was working in this way in my studio that it kind of, it, it dawned on me that the mistakes could be resourced, that the images there, they weren't finite, that this kind of the negative was a starting point. And so there was this kind of infinite possibilities that kind of cracked open that just, um, just, just felt so, um, there was a joy to that and kind of this, this um, sense of freedom. And, and so I feel like, you know, even in this top image in, you know, I, I'll just layer on other things that are kicking around in my studio, but you can actually see in the top image, the, the lips of Romy Schneider. Um, I just happen to like have that be um, the image. She's kind of like in all of the photographs behind me here, but it just happened to be the image that I put below um, my phone when I held it up to the camera. So um, yeah, I, I think there is this kind of inversion, um, Kind of seeing the the negative and the positive you're seeing the source you're seeing the, the outcome it's kind of revealing something about the the trajectory of that image and the, its malleability absolutely um i want to speak now um kind of carrying on through this process now to the larger series and you briefly touched on it at the beginning of the talk but um i want to just give space to think more about sourcing information from pop culture or media culture um, as a way of documenting, analyzing, dissecting, um, assessing our, you know, our not necessarily like um, ours as a collective are, but our, our, our independent experiences um, in the world and how so much of that, to quote John B. Thompson, is uh, our understanding of history is distinctively mediated um, and how the, you know, without being too theoretical or too historical here, you know, that is a unique phenomenon for anyone born um, in the 20th century and thereafter is that, you know, when we think of the past, um, even if we didn't live the past, we have a media image, right? Um, I think an example I often use for my students when I used to teach was, you know, that all of them can remember World War II, even though none of them were alive. And that's because we have this mediated understanding of history as being a very distinctive thing and how personal that can become where, you know, we either our favorite musicians or favorite films um, become these hallmarks and our way into remembering something or reliving something. And I definitely see that, you know, without like knowing too much about, you know, what's um, your personal experience has been. Um, beyond just the titling of Romy Schneider and Mariah Carey and um, Carrie uh, from Carrie, uh, it feels to be this uh, this kind of personal recollection that's happening. Um, and it's even spoken as much in that booklet where um, part of the wonder of the collaboration was having other people speak about how personal that Mariah Carey clip is to them. You know, they're dissecting mm -hmm. it for when they first saw it when someone first sent them the meme, you know, why they use it as a catchphrase. And I, I just would love for you to say more about that personalization of these mediated histories that is running concurrent across your body of work with people like Romy Schneider, Mariah Carey, and, and specifically Carrie, which I have to put an asterisk here. That's my favorite film of all time. I watch it once a month and I've watched it once <laughs> a month for the past 12 years. So <laughs> we got to talk. We, yeah, we but there's like <laughs> this is just the beginning. There. <laughs> I love that so much. That movie really holds up. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, there's um, a quote from Anne Collier, the photographer, talking about her use of um, iconic women in in appropriating their images in in her work. And I, I feel like we're generationally separated, um, but I, I I like how how she's said that it, it's kind of her way of making a like a diffuse self-portrait and, and I think that that's kind of um, interesting you know kind of thinking about subject formation in the age of images or in the age of the, the internet I mean I think it's 
it's just, it's, it's so ripe. Right. And I, I think that um, the way I've, I've thought about this collapse again, I think this is something we share, Ayana, and, and also Eris, um, Aristilda, who, who will read soon, um, that there is this kind of this um, lack of fear of going high and going low, of just not, of seeing that they're equal. You know, there's not, there's not a, even a need to collapse it. It's just, you know, it's all the same. And I, I find that, and I've, I've thought of it before as kind of, you know, any image that comes to me from my phone kind of feels vernacular in a way. And maybe that's, maybe some, someone will send me a cease and desist at some point and prove me wrong. But I feel like, you know, because it's in my hand, you know, I'm at, it's four in the morning, I'm alone in my studio. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I want to see that Goya painting. And I can pull it up and there's a, a Getty images and I, and I can pull it up and I can make a physical photograph out of it. And so, and then I'm like, oh, but what about that, that song lyric? Or what about that, um, the face of that, that actress or model or that still from that, that film? You know, I can also pull that up. So I feel like um, there is a fam familiarity and um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I would be curious to hear what, what you would say more. I, I, I want to hear you talk more about that, but I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, one more thing I want to say, I, I do feel like there is this kind of connection that I'm feeling toward the, the 70s, maybe toward the 90s. My, my own, I, I teach my students, I'm always asking them, my students who are in their 20s, and I'm like, what about the 90s? Do you love so much? Please tell me, <laughs> you know, like I lived it the first time. I don't like, what about, and then like universally they'll, they'll say, oh, because you didn't have a cell phone on you. And, and so they, they're feeling like there's this kind of the, the way people were tethered to reality before the, the cell phone or the smartphone um, became so um, widespread that, 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 that they have a certain nostalgia for that era that they were not a part of. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I mean, I haven't taught um, in about a, almost a year now. And, uh, but when I, was teaching, you know, I didn't, I, your students sound, I'm very envious of that crop of students. Um, <laughs> they're more wonderful. I, I just want to put it out there. I want to do put that out there. Um, I'm definitely not trying to um, undermine um, their uh, capacity for growth and change. Um, what I will, will say to that, though, is something that I think I learned from them was almost a sense of ennui that I think I feel as a millennial, but I, I think there was a lot of empathy for them because they were so tethered to the digital sphere. Um, and some of them were really remorseful about that, almost in a sense of almost near defeat where they felt that there was no reality beyond that. And a lot of them expressed pain of not feeling like they could unplug and that they yeah. couldn't slow down time. Um, and so I think that's also an you know, teaching always informs anything about one's life, um, at least, you know, if you're invested in it to that degree. So I think that's partially why, you know, a lot of my work has moved on to stillness and mm -hmm. uh, will build towards almost going back to this moment of slow cinema or silent films even, um, because it was based on my encounters with them where they had a hard time sitting still. They had a hard time watching a sequence uh, without a soundtrack. So they, they really struggled with like meshes in the afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. they really struggled with Metropolis, which, um, I screamed that during the pandemic and I was mortified that they all put it on double speed, um, <laughs> just to kind of get it through. Um, but then they also expressed their frustration and not being able to have a soundtrack to let them know when to look up from their phone. So, um, that sense of, almost on the other end, my experience with teaching, you know, um, yeah. my students were so felt like the simulation was the only thing they could understand about themselves. Um, which I don't necessarily know if that's like, I don't think it's neither here nor there. I don't think it's bad. I don't think, you know, um, but I definitely do feel a sense of remorse around, you know, that relationship of feeling like there's only one type of a mediated experience that I think I don't personally have, but I recognize maybe a lot of other people do. Um, and, and I think that's, again, maybe, you know, what 
on a personal note, you know, excites me about your work, but also I think, you know, not that anyone is working like you, but I think artists who have this sense of allowing a multiplicity of what inspires them to be on the table, because it demonstrates the sense of, you know, fullness of, of references from beyond one particular moment that I do think is becoming more and more rare. I think a lot of people, if they're going to cite something, it's, it's very, you know, what's happening now, or what is the citation that everyone is doing now? And it's not allowing that sense of, you know, uh, I don't want to say honesty, but you know, what's, just what is personal to you, um, which is almost mm. cheesy. Um, no, but it, 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 keep going. <laughs> true. Um, of, you know, just uh, the the kinship of Sissy Spacek and Carrie, uh, mm. you know, the glamour of Romy Schneider, you know, the uh, feminine refusal of Mariah Carey, of, of all of these are different women who have no immediate connection or even awareness of one another at times. Um, but they speak to the things that influenced you um, that I think is, you know, really palpable in, in documenting, you know, what you've lived through, um, which, you know, is, is always a pleasure to encounter. You know, I think you, what you just said made me think of so many things. And I, and I think this, again, is just the beginning of a lot of conversations between us. But I, you know, I was attracted to all of these faces. They're the, the, cl the close up. So in for kind of to get theoretical, and I think it's OK to do that, given this audience, you know, um, Deleuze talks in Cinema One talks about the, the, the extreme close up as um, being this this excuse to look at a face, you know that there is you get to see all these micro expressions. Um, I I was thinking um, a lot. Maybe you know I I, I was forced to go back and reread um, a lot of Laura Mulvey, um, her theorizing about the feminine face in cinema as being a way to exactly what you were saying to stop time. Yeah, you know that she says that that is the one thing that stops time that it symbolizes um, stillness, which equals death which yes. for her equals the, the end of utopia. And so I think yes. this, is exactly, this is exactly what you're talking about, death 24 times a second, which was written in 1974. So again, I feel like I'm going, you know, there's a lot of unfinished business here that I think is kind of, um, it's coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> there's more to say. I, no, I think so too. And I, I, you know, I think it's gonna offer some final commentary here. And um, if there's any audience members with questions, um, to put them in the chat, um, and I'll leave um, the Brooklyn Rail team to uh, facilitate those in a minute. But I think even with Laura Mulvey's statement of, you know, death is 24 times per second, uh, 24 frames per second, pardon me, I'm also thinking of, I think it was the Millies, um, who, uh, some of the early projectionists, who also mm -hmm. wrote, you know, I think 1894, right? That the moving image and the translation of time is 24 frames per second is a refusal of death, right? Of yeah. it's actually the thing that lets us know that there will be something that will exist beyond us. And, and that that image, whether or not it is false, you know, um, which is very much a Deleuzian uh, expression, but that, you know, moving on to cinema two, the powers of the forger, that leaning into mm -hmm. the artifices that make us up is actually all that we have to kind of recollect anything. Um, and that understanding that is where the possibilities arise, right? That we might be able to self-document and experience on earth through the faces of others is something that I, I think I'm picking up on your work. And again, it's something that excites me as an artist, as a thinker, um, uh, and as a practitioner um, that I think, you know, is, is really more than just, you know, Mariah Carey. I mean, that's a blasphemous statement. You know, nothing is more than Mariah Carey, but, <laughs> <That's so great. laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's more than just, you know, oh, it's a pop star. And then that's, that in and of itself is interesting. I think it actually provides an avenue of rethinking our represented selves through time and media. Um, yeah. So with that, thank you so much, Carrie. This is Oh my so God, Anna, you're, you're a dream. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know you have to run, but you need yeah. to take some questions from, from the audience. <laughs> no, if there are any, um, but I know we're have the last slide up. Um, you know, I'm so excited oh. to see your solo um, at Mass Mocha coming up in uh, 
next, not next month, but um, almost next almost. month. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, just to, you know, look forward to the mini conversations and things to come. Um, Eleanor, can I um, hand it off to you? Yeah, thank you so much, Ayana and Carrie. That was such an exciting and illuminating conversation. Such a joy to hear about your work, Carrie, from someone who knows the ins and outs of that process really yeah. well. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, our first question is going to be from Sam. Um, Sam, I'm going to give you unmute privileges. You should be able to ask directly. Yes. Um, yeah, I uh, stopped by the gallery and really enjoyed the work. Um, I wanted to ask about um, uh, animation sort of as a category, um, because it seems to me like, you know, it's found footage and then you have these human hands, but it is still, it does still have this element of stop motion. So I'm wondering, you know, do you, do you resonate with that term animation? Um, and you know, also the, the Oxberry was historically used for for cell animation. I'm just sort of interested if that's something that you, you know, if you think about this as part of that lineage or history, or if you sort of just think of it as film or whatever that sparks in you. Thank you, Sam. I, you know, I, uh, for me, I'm really new to this type of making. I think that I had to ask advice from a lot of different friends who are filmmakers. Had a bunch of friends ask around for Oxbury. I had a friend, a dear friend who studied animation and he, he makes video now, but he said, um, oh, you need an Oxbury, <laughs> which I had never heard of before. So I, you know, I was kind of learning as I was going and I, um, so it was, yeah, like I said, it was a steep learning curve, but it, I, I don't feel, you know, I think for me, this is something I kind of forgot to even mention. I, you know, I, I often think about Warhol's films. I've been making a lot of videos. I've been, you know, a lot of my previous projects in the last 15 years have kind of um, gone back and forth between still and moving images, kind of seeing the same phenomenon represented both in, you know, still photographs and then in a kind of a, the more slow video, um, kind of like that other stretch of time and, um, but I've never animated before. So it's new, it is new, but you know, I think something that I heard and it just kind of is stuck in my head that, you know, things want to animate. So it kind of made me feel like, okay, it, it can be kind of like junky and not perfect and it will still come together because our brains are amazing mechanisms, you know? And so I, I, that kind of gave me the sense of promise that, okay, you know, we're, we're going to see what this looks like at the end and hopefully that will translate. But yeah, I'd be curious. I, I, I'm i kind of coming into it from um, like sideways. So I don't, I'm not an expert on the history of it at all or anything, but I have a lot of respect. Um, thank you, Sam. That was Thanks. a great question. Um, we have another question from Carolyn. Um, and if anybody else in the audience has a question, please feel free to raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for the talk um, today. Um, I'm thinking a lot about uh, like fiction in your work and if fiction is the same thing as simulation. Um, and I, I saw you at the um, Stephanie Jemison uh, book launch, I believe. And I that talk like really got me thinking a lot about doubling and what she kind of had to say about, um, I mean, I guess fiction ac accessing more of the truth than maybe the truth itself. Um, and I'm finding a lot of resonances with this sort of idea uh, in your work. So I'm, I'm it's not a full, fully formed question, but I wonder if you could just sort of maybe expand on fiction as simulation um, or not. Um, and yeah, maybe even how like truth sort of, and or maybe intimacy kind of fits in there. Wow. Um, I'm writing down some of these key words. You know, I, yeah, we were both at this amazing um, book launch reading with Stephanie Jemison on what night was that? 
Thursday. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, oh my God. I mean, so Stephanie wrote a novella and was asked about um, why, why write, why write fiction? Um, and her answer, and it's still, I, I feel like my brain is still processing that whole evening, which was spectacular. But um, I think her, her answer was something about how it was the best, closest way for her to be able to talk about these things that were quite personal in her life, her personal observations, things that she was working through and to kind of allow fiction was a way to allow her to really wrestle with these these things or maybe that's the way I kind of took her in paraphrasing she said it a lot more eloquently but she did talk a lot about this this doubling kind of that she read an excerpt where there were characters that were twinning each other and how she thought maybe in order to um maybe she needed a twin or maybe the character needed a twin and that those ideas really resonate with me in this body of work and, and many bodies of work where I, that I've made where I've kind of thought about um it's very Lacanian, you know, of like, the, I think there is this, um, this notion of maybe perhaps the only way to see oneself in the world is to, to, you know, mimic someone else. And, you know, how, how can one know oneself and it's maybe impossible. And so I think maybe that separation, that creation of fiction is, is one possible path. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That was such a great one, Carolyn. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question from Chloe. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you to Ayana for this amazing conversation. Um, my question is, how do you or do you think about the confrontation that you build with your audience in your exhibitions? Um, and I ask that because I noticed in the booklet, the photograph uh, in the slideshow, that idea of the title of the exhibition being I don't know her, but then there being this doubling or question of do you know her, which is this mm -hmm. very like invitation, I guess, to to enter mm -hmm. into the work. And so I wondered if you had any thoughts on that or anything to expand on there. Um, so I, I maybe what you're quoting is um, from a, a, a contribution by Shayla Laws, a, a Brooklyn based poet who is amazing. You should check out Shayla's work. Um, I, yeah, I think the, um, the confrontation of the audience, is that what you asked? That's, that's so interesting. I think the, um, huh. I, I, I think I'd have to think about that some more because I feel like there, there is, um, maybe the connotation of that, that word is that there is some aggression or that I'm, you know, kind of infringing on <laughs> their space. And I feel, I feel like that would, um, to ask uh, something of anyone uh, or to infringe on anyone would be, um, uh, it, it's kind of antithetical to what I do. I'm not, I'm, you know, but I, maybe it is an invitation. I, I would hope that people would feel, um, you know, not, uh, not that I was demanding them to respond, but maybe there would be a, like they would be compelled to think about um, how they might respond if um, in their own way, I, I don't know. I think the um, I, you know, the there's this companion booklet which anyone can pick up at the at chart gallery. You could just go ask them, or there's a, a digital version online. Um, but I asked a whole bunch of friends who are artists and and writers to, and including Aris, Aristilda, who's about to read her contribution now. Um, that um, just to kind of respond to the idea of. Um, you know, the I don't know her idea, the the meme, you know, the the meme, <laughs> because just kind of like the, the idea or the, the piece itself. So I think maybe in a way I am um, just uh, trying to invite a whole lot of different personal responses. That makes sense. Does that yeah. answer your question, please? <laughs> sense. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. And if there are no last questions from the audience, we are going to transition over to a poetry reading by Aristilda. Yay. Aristilda Kirby is quite a few things. She has published chapbooks with Best American Experimental Writing 2020, Belladonna, and Black Warrior Review. Her book, Daisy and Catherine Squared from Oric Press, will be back with a reissue in the spring, and you can check the link in the chat for that. 
Her work currently covering the bases of writing, art, and performance has been featured in Miguel Abreu Gallery, Entrance, Mac Mellon, and elsewhere. You could call her Eris, like Paris without the P. Thank you so much for being here, Eris. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Eris Dilakubi. Thank you, Eleanor, for that spirited introduction. Um, thank you, Ayana, and, to thank, and thank you for, and, to, and thank you to Carrie for that amazing, vivacious conversation. Like, I just picked up so many gems and so many new things to learn about. Um, before I get into reading my my selection, I just want to uh, talk about a little bit about my history with Carrie. During the pandemic, yeah, we, we became closer friends for sure. I was like her neighbor for like maybe like a year or two before that maybe. Um, and it's just like uh, I started to make my own sort of poetic form kind of at the same time during the pandemic when you know she was starting to make her own cameras and she would have me come over and like hey take the these large uh pillar like rolls of like photographic paper and like sort them in your house because i won't be there to get them and i don't want them to overexpose in the sun because there's like so you know i and i've gone into her studio i've helped her quite a few times and i've seen the camera in person and it's like a room within a room almost it's just like how do you even make this sort of thing. It's just like, how do you even think to make this sort of thing? So I am very, uh, very honored and pleased and pleasured um, to, you know, bathe in, in the mirth and in the, in the light of Carrie's brilliance and to have something of my own to contribute to that. And, and the way, like, even the poem and how it's printed in the book, it's like with her own sort of periphery and her own sort of touch behind it. And when she when she did that, I was just like, oh, this isn't because I'm making a new sort of book um, with this sort of form that I've made called the Vajra, which is Sanskrit for diamond and thunderbolt together. And, uh, it's like, mm, it's yeah, it's like a negative, like she made a negative of my poem. So this is like the negative version of this poem um, that I'm trying to make because I like to make series of things. So this is like actually demonstrata one slash grossular uh, negative one. Pretty girl unhinges her jaw, and from scarf position, triangles my acute right arm, then loops hers through its void glimpse to tris twist a grip to a Mobius. Part of the ritual, she says, oh, L, you won't keep what you want this way, dear. Fuck me, right? We're here, me, you, and an anaconda vice. Always gaze, to glaze in your patinal pupa with dapple the beam core. I take solace in a warm fade. What can I gain of going under? The meadow felt, not locked, meld lit, blackout hell of being held? Complete the pen and rose flirt like a tartan skirt can write up our sway. We pass a word note consummately. You are in seven of my nine dreams. Fuck you. Utopiate me or I'll bite back, bitch. Er, Ursabet sorbet infused with champagne, boysenberry syrup, mate last in autopsy wise. You want to split it? Frame by frame, I am no more than a toll of spit web and rubrum clot, expurgated from interlude. Spelt hydrangea thief, subcute petals as a lacrimal caruncle to your chest is ripe carbuncle carrot, corroborate how you carrot, ma pesh. Like better sweet mama too, it's still up when I see you. Now she loves me, she loves me not, she hates me, she loves me more. I will and I raise with weight until, is it just a sweet, sweet fantasy angel? When I close my eyes, you come and you take me on and on and on. And I'm in heaven with my girlfriend, my lovely girlfriend. And yet there's no beginning and there is no end. Time isn't present in this dimension. The strip becomes a ribbon and space is flood with just us. And I say, yes, God gives me his toughest battles because he knows he's next. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank that, you. That, so much. Thank you. No, that poem is about like waiting and being in a liminal space. This whole last year felt like being in a liminal space. Last few years felt like being in a liminal space. And this it feels like we're coming towards a uh, sort of memoir that she reads herself um 
Oh, it's unstable. Okay. Okay, we're good. Um, and she reads from a memoir herself and very eloquently, and she sings some of the parts she even riffs. But uh, it's like this great sort of start to like the year, and I want everyone, because I was like, I'm going to print this out, and I'm going to put it above my, my computer so I can look at it. Uh, Carrie sent it to me. It's like, if I have learned anything in this life work sharing, it is protect your dreams. Even in the face of disadvantages, dysfunction, you can't let anyone define, control, or take away your vision of your life. Not your mother, brother, sister, father, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, fake friend, boss, bully, bigot, manager, partner, assistant, critic, cousin, uncle, auntie, classmate, abusive teacher, mogul, predator, influencer, president, false preacher, fake teacher, co-worker, friend of me with a phone, coward with a Eris, you cut out a little bit. Oh, I think the very last thing on that list, this is a Mariah Carey quote from her memoir. The very last thing is don't, um, don't let anyone change your, uh, change your path, especially not a chicken with a keyboard is the last one that I think it just got cut off. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Eris, you cut out for a second, but Carrie jumped in with the last line. So it was perfect. <laughs> Good. Thank you so okay, much. Work. Love you, Eris. <laughs> Love you too, Carrie. <laughs> oh, oh well, thank you for that really great reading. Thank you so much again, Carrie. Thank you, Ayana. Um, and we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring this NSC program and supporting our growing archive, which you can view on our YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the rail has been a platform for the arts, culture, and politics, and you can support our work with the link in the chat to help us keep running these great events every day. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., please join us for a conversation with Basira Khan and Zoe Hopkins on the event of Basira Khan Wait on History at the Contemporary Arts Center Cincinnati. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Manal Kara. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. You can turn your mics on and say hello and goodbye as you leave. And thank you again for being here. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great. Right. Have a great week. See you all thank soon. You. Wonderful. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thank you.